Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the, um, the introduction. Uh, I am um, a lawyer, although I don't necessarily practice law on a full-time basis, and have them for quite some time. Um, I've spent the last 25 years sort of in and out of law, uh, but uh, principally in businesses, ranging from restaurants, real estate development, golf course development, um, oil and gas, and uh, several high-tech ventures. Um, the last high-tech venture I took public was an RFID company on the TSXV with Brasscan. Um, before I left, we raised $20 million for an early stage technology company that we bought in South Africa. And uh, after I left, they raised another 30, but unfortunately, they just went bankrupt about uh, four months ago. <laughs> but, um, so uh, you learn from your failures, and that's something that I'm going to address in, in, my, in my talk. And, and then I went to do an oil and gas venture in Russia, and uh, now. Um, I'm principally assisting uh, first-time entrepreneurs get out of the gate. Um, the course at Mac that I teach in is unique. There's a couple of courses um, like uh, the Masters of um, Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Mac. It's for engineers, principally for engineers, that have a great technology idea but don't know how to commercialize. And one of the problems um, in Canada is that we really want to commercialize um, uh, our, our great ideas that people in university and entrepreneurs have. Um, but a lot of those people just don't have the skills and, and the experience um, to capitalize on their great ideas, and they fail. In Canada, there's a huge commercialization gap. There's a tremendous amount of innovation going on in our universities, and there's a tremendous amount of young entrepreneurs with great ideas but we, as Canadians, don't uh, do a very good job of commercializing our ideas. In other words, we don't take them from the drawing board um, to make money with them um, very well. Uh, we have exceptions, but not many. Um, so that's the, the principal purpose of the program that I teach in, is to take um, people with advanced uh, technology ideas and teach them how to commercialize. It's not a business program per se, it's how to take your idea and hopefully be successful at commercializing it, uh, which will have a net benefit for Canada. Um, most of you, I understand, are first-time entrepreneurs. Uh, generally, the toughest thing to do when you're a first-time entrepreneur is find financing. This slide uh, speaks to the various stages that you go through when you commercialize an idea and where to get the money from. Um, the first stage, um, principally with uh, uh, advanced technology, is you got to figure out if your technology works, and sometimes that costs some money. Uh, we like to invest in ideas that um, have been tested by an outside engineering company, which costs money. Um, there's commercialization grants, angels, um, there's um, many structured groups in Toronto and surrounding areas. Of, of rich guys that uh, don't have a lot of experience investing um, in some of the ideas that you've come up with, but they're pretty eager to write a check some of them. Um, then there's uh, friends, family, angels, uh, and seed funds. I put friends and family down the road. Um, a little bit of advice, it's a real mistake, I think, um, to uh, borrow money from your family to start a business um, if your family's putting a mortgage say, on, on their home. If you lose your friends and family's uh, money, it's a, it's a horrible thing uh, to live with for the next few years. You never really do recover from that. So, and then there's venture funds. Um, there's venture capital firms uh, in Canada. Um, uh, it's very difficult for first-time entrepreneurs to access, uh, access that money without having revenue. Um, Principally, um, uh, the most difficult part of a startup is finding the money. Now, in Canada, we've got a lot, as I said, we've got a lot of great ideas, but we've got a commercialization gap. And one of the reasons that we do have that gap in Canada is we don't have 
a lot of successful entrepreneurs that have sold their company, like they do in Silicon Valley, that have the money and the execution experience to come in and help first-time entrepreneurs. The people we have in Canada, um, generally, that, that can fill that role are looking for jobs, and they're looking for equity in a company that's going, that's ongoing. So we don't have, in Canada, um, a, a group of people that can really lend support um, to entrepreneurs that have really good ideas but no execution experience. And no execution experience usually means failure. Now, when we look at an early stage financing opportunity, first of all, we evaluate it. And I'll tell you how we do that a little later, but this is a strategy process that we go through. We determine whether we're going to invest in an idea, and principally that's based on a business plan, um, an investor presentation, and some due diligence. Then we make a decision, and this is the most important decision that um, financiers or investors make. Or, um, uh, they they want to determine whether you're somebody that can execute on your business strategy, whether you've got the correct business strategy, whether you've got a great technology um, is one thing. But the second thing is, can you execute on that strategy? And if you can't, and this is the problem with a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, they can't get out of their own way. They need to um, operate um, their businesses um, without experience, and that tends to uh, cause business failure and loss for, for investment uh, uh, for, the, for the investors. Um, and in the early stage, what we like to see is we like to see financing coming in through different stages. And to speak to a technology idea, what we usually do is say, okay, how much do you need to validate your technology to get an outside engineering company to say that it works? And after that, the next typical stage is usually a prototype. How much is it going to cost to get to that stage? <coughs> the third stage is, is some sort of a marketing um, assessment. And then what we insist on is enough money um, to cover your fixed costs or burn rate for 18 to 24 months. What's most important to people that are looking to invest in early stage companies? Well, to the entrepreneur, especially in a technology company, they view it as the technology is the most important thing. It's not. The idea is not the most important thing to a financer. The most important thing is management's ability to execute on a well-defined plan. It's not the technology. When I bought IPCO, there was 40 engineers in South Africa who thought the technology was 80% and the uh, money was uh, 20%. It turned out to be exactly the opposite. And they were shocked. They couldn't believe it. But that's, that's the way it goes. The next most important thing um, is the money. You don't have the money, you don't operate. Third most important thing is the technology of the business idea. Of course, that's got to be good. Now, first-time entrepreneurs always get this reversed. I think the technology is the most important thing. And what do, why do entrepreneurs fail? Well, at this stage, they don't take into account risk. Certainly when they're developing cash flows. Everybody's seen the hockey stick, and uh, people in my business want to see that. They want to see something with lots of revenue quickly. But that's not realistic. I've seen lots of cash flows that show that, that don't even come close to hitting the mark after two to three to four years. So first time entrepreneurs never take into account risk factors. And in business plans that I see that don't take into account uh, risk factors, I have a real problem with that. But I'm certainly not an expert in every business plan that I read or every business. There's always typically a valuation disconnect the technology entrepreneur or the entrepreneur always values um, his technology or her technology more um, than money. And money's only ever worth what money's worth. So you always get a disconnect. Um, frequently today, um, what you see for a lot of early stage financing is the valuation game is just impossible to do uh, at that early stage. So 
Um, you see a lot of convertible debentures um, in the marketplace that are convertible based on a price of a second or third round of funding. Um, so it leaves the valuation um, exercise down the road. Sometimes that's impossible to do, especially with angel funds or angels. They like to know how much equity they're getting off of that. Um, I like to use um, I like to use a convertible uh, venture because if the entrepreneur does a good job, he gets more of the money, and the investor um, it, it, it may get less. But it's better to get less in a more successful company than to get zero if it's a failure. Um, ego versus execution. First time entrepreneurs always think that they can be the next Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or, and um, without exception, those entrepreneurs typically fail. The, the, the number of entrepreneurs that are successful out of the gate for the first time is probably less than 2%. If you haven't got the execution experience, chances are you won't get the money if you're looking for it in a serious place. And if you don't have the execution experience, but you've got a great idea, find someone who's got some execution experience that can help you out and teach you. Um, I don't, uh, nobody uh, that I know of on Bay Street um, invests in um, entrepreneurs without some execution experience. If you execute it successfully a couple times, it's almost uh, a blank check for some, for some ideas. But if you don't have execution experience, which probably covers most of the people in this room, find someone that does that you can work with. Networks. Um, first time entrepreneurs need to understand the value of networks. Uh, to try to find someone with money to help you commercialize um, your business, you need to have a well-defined network. And you start networking um, even tonight get my business card, some of the guys on the panel get their business cards. The best way to find money to commercialize your idea is to uh, know lawyers, accountants, investment bankers, if you're um, that well in tune with Bay Street. But you need to know people to make connections. So it's important that you've got your hand out and you're, you're, you're creating a network from day one. That's the most important thing for an entrepreneur. Okay, the next most important thing, and this may not be the topic uh, uh, for tonight, but a business plan. Um, I read a lot of business plans, and I get fed up with anything that's longer than 15 pages. I don't like reading long, thick manuals, and I certainly don't like dissertations about your technology. So this is not a talk about business plans. I spend two months on business plans in my course. But it's important that your business plan be short and concise. Business communication um, does not involve long <coughs> novels about how wonderful your, your technology is or how wonderful you are. It's short, concise, and to the point. The next thing um, is the investor presentation. Frequently, you'll be called upon to give a 15-minute investor presentation to investors. There's nothing worse than sitting through a presentation that takes longer than 12 to 15 minutes that's boring that involves more than 10 to 12 slides. The rule of thumb is if you're going to make a, everyone should have an investor presentation if you're a first time entrepreneur. And it should be no more than 10 to 12 slides. Um, if you take my business card, I will send you a handout of what should be on each slide but it should be very specific and it should not be longer than 10 to 12 slides. Um, I've done lots of investor presentations for businesses that I've had and I've learned the hard way. I've failed as much as I succeeded and you learn a lot from failure. And one of the key things in the course that I teach is how to um, prepare an effective investor presentation. Um, if your business plan gets you in the door and you've got to present um, to a group of investors, you've got to hit the mark within 10 to 15 minutes, and you can't pour them, you can't forget, you've got to practice, and it's not an easy thing to do. But it can't be longer than 10 to 12 slides. I've seen people come into my office with 40 to 50 slides, it never works, okay? You lose, 
you, you lose your audience um, right out of the gate. Now, a very good presentation on the internet, on YouTube, is, is by a guy named Guy Kawasaki. Has anybody ever heard of him? It's very good. He's got a book, but he has, there's a bunch of his um, speeches like this on the internet, and he's great. But he'll tell you how to, how to create a business or an investor presentation. So I urge you to Google um, Guy Kawasaki's name and listen to him for 15 or 20 minutes. He's excellent on how to get the investor presentation correct. Then the most difficult part for most people is speaking in front of people. Uh, I don't particularly like it too much, and, and most people don't. It's, you, know, you feel the fear and you do it anyway. Um, my program at school, I force my students to get up four or five, six times in front of the class to give it uh, anything from an elevator presentation to uh, a business plan presentation. It's a difficult thing to do. The person who does it by far and away the best I've ever seen is Steve Jobs, who unfortunately passed away last week. Um, but if you go on the internet and you look at some of his investor presentations or some of his product launches, he's a phenomenal speaker. When he brings something, uh, a product out like the iPhone, it's almost as if he's showing you a loaf of bread that just smells so good. You know, he just he wants the he wants you to think. He wants you to think that that's just the next uh, the best thing in those cookies over in the side of the room. And he's very good at communicating. Um, if you look at his slide presentations, um, they are um, very simple, usually one or two words. And he speaks to the audience like uh, no one I've ever seen, frankly. And he does a great job. Um, but if you hit all those points right, um, you'll have more success in your commercialization effort. Um, but those are that's, that's a list of some of the things that I see in my day-to-day business and more frankly where I failed um, throughout the businesses I've had and learned the hard way. That if investors get some of this right and have the maturity to, s to look themselves in the mirror to determine that they don't have the execution experience, they will be more successful and hopefully fail less. Successful commercialization is a learned art. There's no question about it. Can't. It's very difficult to teach it in school. I try. I hope I, I, do, I give my students the benefit of my years of trial and uh, tribulation, but it, it, it is a learned art. You've got to do it, and you can't do it without a successful mentor. Um, a mentor in a business, to me, um, doesn't cut it. You need someone that's on your team if you're a first-timer that's got their money invested that can teach you the ropes. And then it's okay to fail, because you will fail. Most first-time entrepreneurs do fail. Don't fail more than once or twice, and learn from your failures and your mistakes. And if you learn, you will be successful. Anyway, I'm sorry, I've given you what I can do within the time allotted. Uh, any questions? Can you explain us a little bit clearer what we do? Um, what we do? Uh, we look for uh, early stage technology companies that we can um, finance and bring through the ropes. Uh, and, uh, and, and any other good business opportunity that comes our way. But generally it's early stage technology, that's our expertise. So if we need it, we can contact you. Absolutely. I, I tell you, network. Very important. Okay, any other? Is there a particular reason why you want to use your own YouTube for technology? No, no, any good business. It's usually there's a lot of upside in technology. There's also a lot of downside because not many technologies really, technology companies really make it. You, you mentioned that a, an investor wants to be able to gauge the entrepreneur's ability to execute. And then you were talking about how uh, people who don't have that execution experience should partner with people who do. Um, 
what are like what are the investors looking to see when they're gauging your ability to execute? Okay. I mean, if, when, is it a matter of getting experience? You know, this like how do I get experience if I don't have experience? Yeah, well, you have to partner someone that does. Like my that's my view. Um, my fellow panel members may differ uh, with that view, but generally, when you're giving that 15 minute uh, um, investor presentation, they're not the investor's not really too concerned about what's on your slides, and he's not really too concerned about your technology because he's already done his homework, he understands it. He's looking at you, he's deciding whether or not he wants to place a bet on you. So then how important is charisma? It helps, like I've seen logo well, Steve Jobs. Like he, he doesn't have the most charisma, but he's very effective. My partner in IPICO, my, the technology company I took public, was a magical speaker. Gordon Westwater, a magical speaker. He, well, he raised, after um, I left, he raised another $35 million for IPICO. When IPICO and RFID was going like this. So is it a matter of confidence? Of yeah, confidence? it's confidence, sure. Presentation? Confidence. Yeah, you've got, to, you've got to get up there and you've got to really, you've got to really ring a bell. You know, you've got to convince people you're a good dad. But even if you do all that and you have no execution experience, it's a, it's a tough road. Right. It's a tough road. Yeah. If you want to create something more than just simply a cottage industry. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So you mentioned uh, some commercialization grants. Can you mention a couple of them? Which ones? Uh, commercialization grants. Oh, well, that is not my specialty. Um, usually I come into contact with companies that have already gone, you know, gone to OCE, and I think there's a speaker here from OCE that will tell you a bit more about that. That is not my specialty. So you mentioned that the initial funding should come from family and friends. No, I said the initial funding should not come from, unless you've got a really rich dad, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but no, you should not take money your first time out from your family or friends if they can't afford to lose the money. Okay. Okay? Now, that, uh, that being said, people will do that and they will regret it. I'm just telling you my experience. I understand, but this is what I found contrary because venture funds are out there to take risks. I'm not risking my house because I have a good idea because there's a lot at stake. Well, if you don't want to risk your house, why should we risk our money on you? No, but uh, I can risk. I have some risk capital that I can use, but that may not be enough. Right? But I'm not going to risk my house on that. Then maybe this isn't for you. Okay, but what I'm saying is it's okay to risk and take chances on your own. Uh, uh, if you got a wife and kid at home that depend on that house, and you finance it and you lose. Okay, I've been through that personally. I know what that's like with my family. So, so that brings me to my actual question. What are the milestones that are expected to be met with my own money? Like what, where should I have um, that's, that. Now that's a good question. Um, I call them badges of credibility. When you go to a financial institution looking for money, venture funds, if you've got a great idea, what's that worth? It's not worth much. If you've got a technology um, evaluation from an independent engineering firm, that's something. I like to see those. Um, if you've got a prototype that's working that your engineering company has tested, and there's some marketing studies on that, that's pretty good too. So the farther you get down that road with your own money, um, the more of the company that you'll end up keeping. Last yeah. question. Yes, um, I, I noticed your graph about where you get the money, and it was a linear line uh, going up. Um, my point is that it's really not linear. It's very, very difficult for the first few yes. steps, and it gets a lot easier as you move up that My night. PowerPoint skills aren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> But, but anyway, you're right. It's very hard to get money early on. Like unless you've got a rich father, um, it's it's very difficult. It really is. The reason I mention that is that that is an example uh, of the gap you were talking about. Yes. At that very early stage. It's yeah. There's not a lot of VCs in the market today looking to gamble on first-time entrepreneurs. I, I don't know of any. They all they're all looking for revenue. You know. Um, got Imperial College of Excellence that, that take risks at the lower end, but you know, venture capital right now is dried up. Like the, the day of uh, the blue sky is gone, but with technology it goes like this. 
you know, there's ups and flows. Any other questions? Yeah, here. Uh, regarding a risk evaluation, first time entrepreneurs, what course of action would you suggest, you know, like as a team, we could, we could come up with scenarios, do the research, and come up with risks that we believe can be detrimental to uh, our project, but would you suggest that we take third party uh, consultation? In, in well, it's hard to pinpoint, you know, it's hard to answer that question without a specific example, but um, as a generalization, and you can't do much more than that in a talk like this, as a generalization, entrepreneurs never see the risk, they never see the downside. But if you've been around as long as I have and seen a lot of train wrecks, especially one of my own for $50 million with IPCO, um, you learn to realize that there are risks. Like in 2004, 2005, RFID was going to be the next thing since sliced bread. It was going to be huge. Everybody thought there was going to be a chip on, on everything. That didn't happen. That wasn't realistic. And there was a lot of people that bought stock at 25 cents and wrote it to four or five bucks to see it go down again. And Ipico is a classic example of really good technology that they didn't make it for a number of reasons. That, and it wasn't because they couldn't execute. But though I can tell you when I bought the company, those 40 smart guys in South Africa thought that the business was worth 250 to 500 million. When we sold it on Bay Street to Brascan, which is now Brookfield, we sold it for 37 million. You can imagine the disconnect, but they needed the money. It's actually just taking a step back from the project. Right, it's hard to do, even for people with experience. You know, you, sometimes you bet and you win, sometimes you bet and you lose. But you know, in the VC game, you, you have a lot more losers than winners, you know, even if you're a good VC. But from your seat, um, you need to consider the risks um, because without a solid consideration of risk, your pro forma um, financial statements usually are, are flawed, completely flawed. Um, and when you're making your assumptions in your business plan on, on revenues, you need to understand that, you know, I've, I've probably seen a thousand cash flows that go like that. DC is the first thing DC will tell you. I want to see this. I want to see a game-changing idea or product in that business plan. I want to see something that will revolutionize the industry that you're going to attack. Okay, but even then, that's not enough. Today, it's harder today. You need execution experience. And if you don't have it, you need to get somebody on your team that does, that's done it before. And that's hard to do in Canada. We don't have you know, 150 guys, you know, to 300 guys like they do in California, Silicon Valley, waiting around for the, you know, the next big uh, Facebook play. You know, people in Canada tend to say, okay, give me a quarter million dollars a year and, you know, some stock options, and I'm pretty happy with that, but how many of you can afford to pay that? You know, that's the disconnect. That's Canada. But you can work around that, but it's hard. It really is. It's a lot more difficult. So my time's up. Thank you so much. Okay.